Hello, David Snowpeck here from Snowpeck Games, and this is part 7 in a tutorial series about implementing rollback netcode in a game built with the Godot game engine. Last time, we talked about adding offline play to a game that was built with the Godot rollback netcode add-on, using the same gameplay code for both online and offline play, including all the special nodes and virtual methods like network process and get local input. And that was it. <laughs> it was a very short video, at least as far as my videos go. This time, we're going to be talking about input delay and interpolation, starting with input delay. There are all sorts of videos and articles on the internet discussing rollback netcode versus input delay netcode, and many people come away from them thinking very simplistically, rollback equals good and input delay equals bad. The truth, of course, is more complex and subtle than that, as it usually is, because Almost all implementations of rollback also include input delay. GGPO, which is a very popular library for impl implementing rollback netcode, allows you to configure an input delay, and so does the Godot rollback netcode add-on. You can configure it in project settings, and actually it uses a default value of two. What is actually bad is using input delay as your primary means of network synchronization, because it is not robust to varying network conditions. But if rollback is your primary means of network synchronization, then input delay can be a very useful tool. But first, let's talk about what input delay actually is. Here's one of our classic timelines that we've been using throughout this video series. Again, we're going to assume there's a two frame latency between these two peers. So when peer one sends its input on frame one, it doesn't arrive at peer two until frame three and vice versa. So let's say peer one gathers the input for the local player, we'll call that player one, on frame one, but rather than using it right away on frame one, it just holds it in a buffer. Then later on frame three, it uses the input it saved from frame one together with the input it just received from peer two for player two. So on frame three, the game is essentially executing tick number one, and it's fully in sync because we have the real input from both players. This is input delay. Specifically, it's two frames of input delay because we are gathering the local input and then delaying when we are actually going to use the local input by two frames. And assuming there's exactly two frames of latency consistently throughout the whole match, then using two frames of input delay will keep the match exactly synchronized. No artifacts or anything. And that's great, right? Way simpler than, than implementing rollback. Obviously, the problem with relying primarily on input delay to keep the match synchronized is if the latency changes at all during the course of the match, like if it goes up to three frames or down to one frame, the match will start to get out of sync. You'd need a perfectly stable internet connection, and in my experience, at least with my crappy internet, latency is rarely perfectly stable. So that's why everyone's always saying input delay is bad. However, if you're using rollback netcode as your primary means of network synchronization, adding just a touch of input delay can have some big benefits. The biggest is that it can dramatically reduce artifacts, maybe even completely eliminating them for good connections. And that's because it's basically impossible for input to arrive on the same tick as it's sent. That means you're gonna to need to roll back on every tick where the other player changes their inputs, which is gonna cause just constant artifacts. Adding input delay gives your messages a little head start, a little bit of extra time to allow them to actually arrive. Let me show you an example. In this GIF, we've got an RTT of around 64 milliseconds, which is two frames of latency, just like the example on our timeline. I'm pressing up and left really quickly and then down and right really quickly. The input delay is turned on, and you can see in the debug overlay that there's no rollbacks at all. You'd see messages in here if there were. And the character is moving completely smoothly insofar as a GIF in a YouTube video can move smoothly. I'm sorry about that. Running this locally, you'd be able to see it much better. Anyway, you can't see the other peers screen in this GIF, but I can tell you that the peers are exactly synchronized. They're showing the exact same thing. In this next GIF, uh, the RTT is the same around 64 milliseconds, and I'm making the exact same inputs, except the input delay is turned off. You'll notice there's three ticks of rollback every time I change my inputs. And it's pretty hard to see the artifacts because the frame rate of the GIF and the fact that two frames of latency is actually really good, but the character appears to be moving much further, much more dramatically. What's actually happening is every time I change inputs, it's mispredicting and the character overshoots its real position and then snaps back once the rollback happens. Again, you can't see the other peer's screen in this GIF, but in this case, it actually looks just like the first GIF. 
with the smaller, smoother movements, but the remote peer is seeing this with the bigger, choppier movements. So we've gone from no artifacts at all and perfect synchronization with the input delay to constant artifacts with the input delay turned off. Now, let's talk about the downsides of using input delay because like all things, there are some trade-offs. Mainly, it reduces the responsiveness of the game controls. If you have two frames of input delay simulating at 60 FPS, that means you press a button, but the game won't actually respond to it until 32 milliseconds later. Now, personally, <laughs> I can't really feel an additional delay of 32 milliseconds unless I play the game with no delay for 30 minutes, then turn on the delay, and for a few minutes, I'll be able to feel the controls are a little more sluggish, but eventually I'll get used to it. Different people have different perceptual thresholds and might be able to notice it more easily, but I think any player can adapt to a small delay. However, to mitigate this, you can, number one, use the same delay for both online and offline play. Using the method we talked about in the last video, any input delay that you configure will get used offline, and that way playing online will feel exactly the same as all the practice the player got playing locally. And in fact, many players won't even notice there's a delay at all because they've never played it any other way. Number two, you can reduce any sort of acceleration or deceleration on your character movement because the mind of the player can actually imagine acceleration when what's actually happening is input delay. The human mind is funny like that. Number three, you can make the input delay configurable by the player on the game's setting screen. This way, if the reduced responsiveness bothers them more than the increased artifacts, then let them make that trade-off. Personally, I find the extra artifacts more distracting than the input delay, making it harder for me to counter the other player's moves, but everybody is different. Now, let's talk about interpolation, which among other things can also help reduce artifacts. Uh, when there's a rollback without interpolation, the character will simply jump to the position it really should have been in. But with interpolation enabled, it'll generate some in-between frames to move the character from its incorrectly predicted position to its new position. Even though this is still technically an artifact, because the in-between frames aren't accurate to what really happened, it can be less jarring than just snapping over, so players might not notice it or might be uh, not as bothered by it. But there's other advantages as well. It allows your game to support high refresh rate monitors. Since we're simulating at a fixed rate, 60 FPS for example, we're only updating the screen positions of everything in the game at 60 Hz. If your player has a monitor that refreshes at 90 Hz or 120 Hz or 144 Hz, well, too bad. <laughs> They're only going to see the game at 60 Hz. But with interpolation enabled, your game can generate frames in between the simulation ticks. These extra frames are purely visual. The underlying game logic will still be running at whatever your simulation rate is, but players with higher refresh rate monitors will get a smoother visual experience. And the last but most consequential advantage to interpolation is that it allows you to reduce the simulation rate in order to give you a higher frame budget. As we've discussed over and over again, if your game simulation runs at 60 FPS, you need to be able to do all your rollbacks and the next tick in less than 16 milliseconds. 16 milliseconds is your frame budget. If you can't get everything done within your frame budget, your frame rate will dip. And if you go enough over, it can actually lead to more rollbacks and getting even further behind, and now you've entered a death spiral. If your input buffer size is 20, that means in the worst case scenario, you might have to roll back and re-simulate 20 ticks in less than 16 milliseconds, which might be a challenge depending on your game. But if you reduce your simulation rate to 30 FPS and enable interpolation, it will be visually indistinguishable from 60 FPS, except now you have a frame budget of 33 milliseconds rather than 16 milliseconds. It also means you can cut your input buffer in half and still accommodate the same amount of latency. An input buffer of 20 at 60 FPS means you can theoretically accommodate 320 milliseconds of latency without losing sync. But at 30 FPS, you only need a buffer size of 10 to do the exact same thing. So not only do you have a bigger budget, but in the worst case scenario, you actually have less work to do. Now, this isn't without downsides. There's trade-offs to everything, so let's talk about those. Adding interpolation will feel to the player the same as increasing your input delay by one. The way that interpolation works is that the game simulates the next tick, but rather than immediately showing the result of that tick, it rolls back to the previous tick and then interpolates forward to the current tick. You can mitigate this problem by reducing your input delay by one. 
if you're not only enabling interpolation, but also reducing the simulation rate, for example, to 30 FPS, that will decrease the responsiveness of the controls even further. Polling input every 33 milliseconds is less responsive than polling every 16 milliseconds. But again, you can reduce your input delay because the lower the simulation rate, the more effective the input delay actually is. If you have a latency of 33 milliseconds, at 60 FPS, you need an input delay of 2 to completely hide that. But at 30 FPS, an input delay of 1 will have the exact same effect. Turning on interpolation has a CPU cost. There's an extra rollback uh, every frame, some extra bookkeeping, and the actual interpolation of the data itself. So if you're not reducing the simulation rate, adding interpolation will actually slow things down because of this extra work per frame. And there's a small developer cost. You need to implement a new interpolate state method on all of your nodes that change visually every tick, but it's actually not that hard. <laughs> and we'll go over how to do that in our demo game. All right. Now we're going to enable interpolation in our demo game and reduce the simulation rate to 30 FPS so that you can see what is involved in doing that. First things first, let's go to project, project settings. We'll scroll down to the network rollback section and tick the interpolation checkbox on. This is also where you'll find the input delay setting, which is currently at its default value of two. If you wanted, you could change that to one to compensate for the interpolation, but I'm actually gonna leave that at two and attempt to compensate by dramatically reducing the acceleration on the character movement. Uh, we are also going to change the simulation FPS to 30, which is done in uh, physics 2D, or I'm sorry, physics common, and the physics FPS is what we're using to set our simulation frame rate. We're going to change it from 60 to 30. Oh, and one more thing, let's go back up to the network rollback section, and we're going to change our max buffer size from 20 to 10, uh, because that will cover the same amount of latency with the new simulation FPS. All right, let's try it. And you will see, ooh, that acceleration is painfully slow. <laughs> and the character moves at about half the speed that it used to. And I think if we drop some bombs, they'll also take about twice as long to explode. So we have some adjustments to make. Let's head over to our player.gd. Uh, first thing, we're going to increase our max speed. We're going to double it from 8 to 16. And our acceleration uh, was 0 0.2. We could just double it to 0 0.4 to have the same acceleration as before. But let's actually crank that all the way up to 1.0 to attempt to uh, hide the input delay a little bit. Let's test it out again. Play locally. And now that acceleration is way less painful. And I'm moving at the same top speed as I did before. But you'll notice that the motion is way less smooth, or maybe you won't notice, because um, <laughs> now it's rendering at 30 FPS uh, rather than 60, and this YouTube video is also being recorded at 30 FPS. You really should download this project and try this stuff out for yourself. There's really no way to accurately show it in a video, but I can tell you, looking at it, it is moving way choppier, way less smooth. I can tell with my eyeballs that the FPS is lower. So we need to actually interpolate the position on our player. And to do that, we are going to implement the interpolate state virtual method. All right, I just copy and pasted that over here. You get the old state dictionary, the new state dictionary, and the weight for how much you should um, interpolate between those two states. And then down here, we just have one line. We are setting our position to the lerped uh, position between the old state's position and the new state's position using this weight. So let's try it again. Play locally. And now the movement is back to just as smooth as it was when it was simulating at 60 FPS. But our bombs are still taking too long to explode. So there's one more thing we need to change. Over in bomb TSCN, we have this explosion timer. Its weight ticks were previously set to 60. So after 60 ticks, it would explode. Uh, that would mean after a second, now that we're running at 30 FPS, uh, that would be two seconds. So let's change this to 30 to make it back to about one second. And on the explosion.tscn, it has this despawn timer, which previously was set to 15. And let's approximately have that to 7. Now let's try it. And now our bombs are exploding after the same amount of time as they used to. So there you go. Our simulation frame rate is now 30 FPS rather than 60. The game should perform better.
require less CPU, have a bigger frame budget, and look better on high refresh rate monitors. But as you saw, there's a whole bunch of things you need to fix if you change the simulation frame rate. So if possible, try to determine that as early on as you can in a project. I would personally recommend 30 FPS. It'll just make your life as the game developer so much easier. But ultimately, the choice is up to you. That's all I have for you today. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or on the Snowpack Games Discord or wherever. Next time, we are going to finally dig into Network Animation Player and animate our bombs and explosions. So please subscribe on YouTube, check out snowpackgames.com for a link to the Discord and more information about me and my work. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.